Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of the fifth module, which is going to be on combinational circuits. So in the last lecture, we kind of gave a brief introduction to the combinational circuits, how exactly we implement these combinational circuits using logic gates, uh, using Boolean functions and so on. And we also discussed the static characteristics as in the VTC of a simple LAN gate. And that can be extended to the analysis of any other combinational circuit. I mean, you can analyze NOR gates as well using the same concepts. In this lecture, we would be discussing about dynamic properties or basically how do we size these combinational circuits. The disclaimers remain the same. So let us discuss how we exactly size these combinational circuits. We remember from our discussion on CMOS inverter that we make the width of this CMOS, like if NMOS is sized as W min and L min, then in order to have you know symmetric inverter VTC, in order to equalize the TPLH and TPHL, what we did was we kind of increased the width of this PMOS. Why? We used the width of beta here as compared to you know W min. Why so? Because the mobility of holes is smaller as compared to mobility of electrons. And beta is precisely that ratio, right? The ratio of the equivalent resistance. And for ISO VT, it's equal to the ratio of mobilities, right? So that is what we did in the case of CMOS inverter. So our goal was to achieve symmetric inverter characteristics, to have high noise margins, to have equal resistance of both the transistors, like equal equivalent resistance that charges or discharges this capacity. That was to you know, equalize TPLH and TPHL so that we have 50% duty cycle. Right? Now, what is our goal? So our goal is to design combinational circuits with minimum area, right? Because area is something which influences the cost. And we want balanced worst case TPLH and TPHL. Why worst case TPLH and TPHL here? Why we are talking about the worst case? Because here our TPLH, TPHL, noise margins, everything is input pattern dependent, right? So we have to talk about worst case TPLH and TPHL. Because the best case is anyways, you know, good for us. So we have to always assume or design our stuff, our combination circuits, considering the worst case TPLH and TPHL. So what we want to essentially achieve is we want to achieve equal worst case TPLH and TPHL so that even for the combination of circuits under consideration, what we end up having is we end up having 50% UTC. So for that to, you know, for that to be possible, what we actually ensure is we ensure by our way of designing that the worst case equivalent resistance of the pull-up network of our combinational circuit is equal to the worst case R equivalent of the pull down network. And at the same time, we also ensure that they are equal to R equivalent zero, which is the equivalent resistance of minimum sized NMOS or beta sized PMOS. Right? Why do we want to equate it to R equivalent zero? That is a question which is not answered in any book. So, what exactly is the reason behind that? So, if you have the worst case R equivalent pull up network equals to worst case R equivalent of pull down network equals to R equivalent zero, which is kind of you know the equivalent resistance for both charging and discharging this CL for a standard inverter. Then what you end up having is you end up having the propagation delay of the combination circuit less than equal to the propagation delay of standard inverter. So propagation delay of standard inverter is nothing but 0.69 R equivalent zero CL. Why? Are equivalent zero CL because the equivalent resistance of both PMOS and NMOS is same, and TP is kind of arithmetic mean of TPLH and TPH, right? Now, if the worst case equivalent resistance of pull up network or pull down network is R equivalent zero, then the worst case combinational circuit delay would be equal to TP of standard inverter. For all other cases which represent the best case, your combination circuit delay will be less than equal to standard inverter. So that is the reason. Why we use this R equivalent zero, or why we kind of you know try to make this worst case of R equivalent of PUN as well as PBN as R equivalent of zero. However, there is an inherent assumption here. The assumption is that you know CL is dominated by C external. That is, C external is pretty large as compared to C internal of the combinational circuit. Otherwise, when you size the combinational circuit, C internal will increase and CL will increase, right? So that way it won't give you enough benefit of sizing. So the assumption, inherent assumption here while dealing with combination circuits is that C int is pretty small as compared to CN. And any increase in CN 
is not increasing CL by that much. So that is your inherent assumption. Now with this information, let us try to size the NAND gate first. So this is your NAND gate, which we discussed in the last lecture. So let us draw its equivalent, you know, resistor and switch kind of network. So this is its equivalent resistor switch network. So you have these two N MOSFETs are equivalent one of N MOSFET to which this D input is connected. So this acts like a switch. In the on state, its resistances are equivalent of one. This N MOSFET also acts like switch. When A equals to one, the switch turns on. I mean, it is closed. And its on resistance is R equivalent of P. I mean, you can you cannot call it on resistance. It's actually the equivalent resistance going from uh, VDD to 0.5 VDD, right? That is how we define this R equivalent resistance. So this is the switch with you know R equivalent. So that is how you are kind of you know representing this MOSFET here. So now we are looking at you know its resistor switch equivalent. So let us focus on the pull-up network first. So what is the best case for pull-up network? The best case is when a is equal to zero as well as b is equal to zero. That is both of them are closed, right? So in the best case, what we have this CL which is here, this would be charged by a parallel combination of R equivalent three and R equivalent of four, right? So in that case, your TP TPLX what would be? It would be 0.69 R equivalent four parallel R equivalent three into CL, right? And that represents the best case, or I would say the least TP TPLX value. Now we discussed what would be the worst case. So worst case would be either B bar is equals to zero or A bar equals to zero. That is, the load capacitor is being charged only by one of these B MOSFETs. So what I told earlier, we have to include, we have to consider only the worst case, right? For uh, designing for TPLH or TPHL, we have to consider the worst case scenario. Because if we design it for the worst case, the best case is that will anyway be better than that, right? So, in the worst case for pulled up network, only one P MOSFET is on. So, in that case, what we have to do? We have to size it such that this R equivalent of 3 is equals to R equivalent of 4 is equals to R equivalent of 0, right? Because we want to equate it to the uh, TPLH of standard inverter, right? So, R equivalent of pull up network should be equal to R equivalent of 0. And for worst case, the R equivalent is R equivalent of 3 or R equivalent of 4. So we have to make R equivalent of 3 equals to R equivalent of 4 equals to R equivalent of 0. Right? That is how we will size it. Okay. So this is first. And we also want our R equivalent of pull down network to be R equivalent of 0. So let us look out, look at our pull down network. So what is the worst case for this pull down network? Or when does this pull down network actually work? This pull down network works only when A equals to 1 and B equals to 1. Right? So for this case, the kind of R equivalent that this capacitor load capacitor sees for discharging would be R equivalent of 1 plus R equivalent of 2, right? Because they are in series. Now, assuming that these MOSFETs are identical, what you have is you have R equivalent plus R equivalent of 2 equals to twice R equivalent of 1. And we want that equal to R equivalent of 0, right? For matching its delay to the uh, standard inverter, we want it to be R equivalent of 0. So, what does that give us? This gives us that. R equivalent of 1 should be equal to R equivalent of 2 and that should be half of R equivalent of 0. So when is it half? When you increase its width by 2, right? So now, how can we size it? So we'll size it in the following way. Let us discuss that. Since our R equivalent of 3 is equal to R equivalent of 4 is equal to R equivalent of 0 and we know that beta times, if you size MOS, a P MOSFET beta times, its equivalent resistances are equivalent of 0. So, how we will size it in the band game? We'll just make them beta. So it remains same as the size of standard CMOS inverter. However, since we want R equivalent of 1 equal to R equivalent of 2 equals to half of R equivalent of 0, what we need to do is we need to make this transistor double the size, right? So if we double the width of these transistors, then equivalently when they come in series, this R equivalent 0 by 2, it is R equivalent series like R equivalent 0 by 2. So effectively it's R equivalent 0. So what we do is we increase the bit by two for both these and MOSFETs, right? So this is how we do it. And if you size your NAND gate like this, then you ensure that the propagation delay of NAND gate is always less than equal to the propagation delay of a standard CMOS inverter. Now let us also look at the area here, right? So 
if we assume that w min into l min is area a zero, that is, if you have a minimum size, if you have minimum sized n MOSFET, if its area is a zero, then what is the area of this gate? It's two times a zero here, right? So it's two times a zero here. It's two times a zero here. It's beta is like it's beta a zero here and beta a zero here. So if you add it, how much that becomes? It's two beta plus four a zero, right? And if you take out this two, it's two plus beta a zero, right? That is how you can find out you know the area of this equivalent area of this gate. As you mean that, and this is just you know a way of estimating area. Real area is not this because in real layouts. You always employ techniques such as you know contact sharing and all, which we discussed in one of the discussion sessions. And then the effective area becomes lower than this value. This is just for first-hand calculation for benchmarking different gates, right? That is how we do it. Now, once we have discussed sizing of NAND gate, let us go ahead and discuss the sizing of NOR gate. So this is your NOR gate, as we discussed in the last lecture. So now, how we do it? I mean, let us replace this also by its equivalent register switch network. So it looks something like this, right? Here, what is of interest? So here, your pull down network is of interest. So what's the best case with respect to the pull down network? It's when A is equals to B equals to one, right? So in that case, both of these MOSFETs are turned on and MOSFETs are turned on. And this CL discharges with this MOSFET and this MOSFET in parallel, right? So equivalent resistance here becomes R equivalent zero by two for the best case scenario. But best case is something that we have we don't have to consider, we have to consider the worst case. So what is the worst case for pull down network here? It's when either A is conducting or B is conducting, right? Well, whether A is one or B equals to one. So in that case, only one of them is kind of, you know, discharging the CL, right? So for the worst case, in the case of NOR gate, we have in the pull up, pull down network, only N, one N MOSFET is on. So what should we do? We should make its resistance equal to R equivalent of zero, right? So here in this case, we have R equivalent one equals to R equivalent of two equals to R equivalent of zero, right? This is how we size its uh, pull down network. Now let us focus on the pull up network. So even the R equivalent of pull up network should be R equivalent of zero. What do we have in the pull up network? In the pull up network, we have these two P MOSFETs in series, right? So the effective charging time constant will depend upon R equivalent of three plus R equivalent of four times CL, right? So, if we have to make these, you know, if we have to make this equal to R equivalent of zero, and if you assume that these are identical P MOSFET, then R equivalent of three equals to R equivalent of four equals to R equivalent zero by two, right? That is how we have to uh, kind of, you know, uh, scale it or size it, right? And that way we'll ensure that PP of this NOR gate is always less than or equal to PP of inverter, okay? So, how can we size it? So. As we see that you know R equivalent of one has to be equal to R equivalent of zero, and what is R equivalent of zero? It is the resistance of minimum sized and MOSFET. So we don't have to size it. It can be minimum sized in the pull down network. However, if you look at this pull up network, what do you see? You see that these resistances have to be half R equivalent of zero. So we have to increase its width by two, right? So we have to increase its width by two, and its width was already beta in case of you know your Standard CMOS inverter. That is, a P MOSFET gives you R equivalent zero only if it is sized to beta. So if has if you have to reduce it its resistance further by two, you have to multiply its width by two. So its size becomes two times beta, right? So this is how you size your NOR gate. And now, as you make the same thing, that is W W min into L min is equal to A zero. What is the area of this gate? Area of this gate becomes two plus four beta times A0, right? So now if you compare it with the previous result, you find out that, you know, the area here of NOR is actually larger as compared to NAND. And that is why in the last lecture I was saying that, you know, NAND is a preferable design choice. If you have to make a standard cell, you make it in the NAND configuration and then you repeat it to realize, you know, complex Boolean functions instead of NOR, just because of this area. Okay. So now let us see what happens when we increase the number of inputs or when we increase the number of fan ins. And let us take the case of NAND gate first. So if you increase the number of fan ins, how you have to size it? So you have to make, so first look, let us look at the pull down network. So for pull down network, 
you have to make each transistor like width by n times the original width. Why? Right? Because you have to make this R equivalent series equals to R equivalent of zero. So what is this series resistance of this? It's n times R equivalent, right? R equivalent of these MOSFETs. So n times R equivalent of these MOSFETs has to be equals to R equivalent of zero. Therefore, R equivalent of these MOSFETs has to be R equivalent zero by n. So if it has to be R equivalent zero by n, you have to scale their widths by n times. So you have to scale the widths of this n MOSFET by n times for NAND gate. However, worst case pull up here remains same. That is, it remains same as this R equivalent of A1, A2, A3, AN, and so on. I mean the P MOSFET. So here they are sized beta itself. Now, if you look at the area of the gate, area becomes what? Area becomes n into n plus beta times A0. You can actually verify this. How I do it is let us take a combination of P and N. So each input is fed to you know both the pull-up network and the pull-down network. So corresponding to one input, that is A1, we have N A0 for N MOSFET and we have beta A0 for P MOSFET. So for one input, what, what is the equivalent area? For one input, it's n plus beta, right? So it's n plus beta a0 for one input, and there are n such inputs. So the total area of the gate, I mean, approximately is n into n plus beta times a0. So you see that, you know, for a fanning of n, that is for n inputs, the area increases quadratically with n. So that is one disadvantage. Then you have large number of fannings. So area increases quadratically. Now let us take the case of PMOS, uh, sorry, let us take the case of NOR gate implementation. So for NOR gate implementation, the pull down network, worst case remains only one MOSFET will be conducting. So it is R equivalent zero. So we size everything to be like, we size every N MOSFET to be as the minimum size. However, if you look at this P MOSFET chain, so here R equivalent of all these P MOSFET summed together should be equals to R equivalent of zero. So <clears throat> if it has to be R equivalent of zero, what should be the equivalent resistance of each of these P MOSFET? It should be R equivalent zero by N. And for P MOSFET to show R equivalent zero by N, it has to be scaled by beta times N, right? If you do the same analysis here, let's say what is the area of this MOSFET connected to A1? So it's N beta plus one, right? So it's one plus N beta times A0. That is for one input. So for n inputs, it's n into a one plus n beta times a zero. So here also for a fanning of n, the area increases proportional to the n square. Now let us size that complex gate that we encountered that we designed in the previous lecture. So this was the gate, right? <clears throat> so let us size this one. So let us take the worst case delays here. Let us focus on the pull down network first, right? So let us focus on the pull down network. So what is the worst case pull down network? So the worst case is only when one, one of this transistor or one of these you know, uh, two networks conduct. So if only this conducts, then what should be its uh, like, you know, R equivalent zero or what should be its R equivalent? It should be equal to R equivalent of zero. So it should be sized as one. Now let us focus on this part. So in this part, you always have either A plus B, I mean these two MOSFETs, discharging the load capacitor or these two MOSFETs discharging the load capacitor. And equivalent resistance of the series combination of these two has to be equals to R equivalent of zero. So individually their equivalent resistance should be R equivalent zero by two, R equivalent zero by two and R equivalent zero by two. So we size them twice. I mean, we increase their width by two, right? So either this will be the discharging path or this will be the discharging path for all these paths. The R equivalent is R equivalent of zero. That is what we have to ensure. Now let us look at the pull-up network. So pull-up network is here, like that is something which is, you know, interesting. So for the pull-up network, what is the worst case? Worst case is three P MOSFETs in series charging this load capacitor over here. Best case is these two MOSFETs, these two P MOSFETs charging this load capacitor here. So let us take the worst case scenario. So for the worst case scenario, we have these three P MOSFETs charging this load capacitor. And in that case, what happens? So in that case, you have to size them. So if some of these three equivalent resistances is R equivalent zero, what is the individual R equivalent? Individual R equivalent is R equivalent zero by three. 
So if you have to, you know, make its R equivalent three times smaller, you have to increase the width three times. And R equivalent zero is shown by a beta sized P MOSFET. So a three beta sized P MOSFET will show you R equivalent by three, R equivalent zero by three. So you have to size them three beta, three beta, three beta. Now what is interesting is how to size this A, right? Since this is already three beta, if you size this three beta, what is the equivalent resistance? Equivalent resistance will be, I mean, what will, what will be the equivalent resistance of this network? It will be R equivalent zero by three plus R equivalent zero by three. That is two R equivalent zero by three, which is still less than R equivalent zero. So if you size it as three beta, that's fine. But even if you size it by two beta, what exactly will be the equivalent resistance of this series? It will be R equivalent zero by two plus R equivalent zero by three, which is still less than R equivalent zero, right? So even in that case, it works perfectly fine. Your TP of this gate is less than or equal to the TP of the CMOS inverter. However, by reducing this from three beta to two beta, what you essentially achieve is you achieve a reduction in the area. So this two beta is perfect sizing for this. Make sure or in, like one thing to know that you cannot make it beta because if you make it beta, then effective resistance of this becomes larger than R equivalent zero. Now, if you calculate the area of the gate, what exactly is the area of the gate? It's one plus two plus two plus two. That is six plus one seven plus 11 times beta is even, right? So this is how you size even the complex circuits. You just look at the worst case, you find out the equivalent resistance, you ensure that the equivalent resistance of the worst case is equal to R equivalent of zero. And the other ones, you can size it so as to ensure the constant constraint that is R equivalent should be less than R equivalent of this best case should also be less than R equivalent of zero. So that is how you do it. Now, once we know the sizing of these circuits, let us go ahead and analyze the delay of these circuits. So let us look at the delay of NAND gate first. So how we size the NAND gate? We have sized the NAND gate like this, right? It's two and two here to make sure that the pull down equivalent resistances are equivalent zero. And the pull up sizing has remained the same as that of the CMOS inverter. See, in the previous case, in the case of inverter, we all already had this V out, and there we had this capacitor. There would be C int as well as C X. But here, in this intermediate node also, we'll have some parasitic capacitance. And that we have you know, uh, represented as C X1. So let us try to find out these parasitic capacitances, CX and CX1. So note here that CX is the like, you know, intrinsic capacitance, which is coming out due to the inherent capacitance components in these MOSFETs, and it's not containing C external. So let us try to find out the values of this CX and CX1. Why we are trying to find out this? It will become very clear once we analyze their delay, but first let us try to find out these internal parasitic capacitances. So let us first focus our attention on this CX. So what is this CX? CX is C intrinsic, like C internal of M4 plus C internal of M3 plus C internal of M2. Why? Because these three nodes or these three MOSFETs are connected to this node. So it will share or it, all the intrinsic capacitances of these three MOSFETs will add up and constitute this CX. So what exactly are the intrinsic capacitances? So intrinsic capacitances can be simply given by gamma CG0 times the width, right? Because the intrinsic capacitances, that is CGD as well as your CDB, both are proportional to the width. So if you have increased the width by beta, what will that do? It, it will increase its intrinsic capacitances by beta. So what is your C int for this? It's gamma beta C0. What is your C int for this M3? It's gamma beta C0. What is the C int for this M2? It's two times gamma CG0. Where CG0 is your intra, like, uh, input capacitance, right? This is something that we discussed in the case of CMOS inverters, that C int is equal to gamma CG0. And then it is just multiplied by the bits because the intrinsic capacitance is proportional to the width of the MOSFET. And gamma CG0 corresponds to uh, the intrinsic capacitance of a minimum sized MOSFET, right? So if you do this, it comes out as gamma two plus two beta times CG zero, right? Now let us find out what exactly is the intrinsic capacitance which is present at node CX one. 
Note that at node CX1, we do not have any node capacitors. Now let us focus ourselves on CX1. So this node X1 is connected to the source terminal of M2 and it is connected to the drain terminal of M1. Since it's connected to the drain terminal of M1, so the capacitance that this node sees is simply C int of M1. That is sure, right? Because this is connected to the drain of S. However, the, what are the capacitance of M2 that are connected to this node? So all the capacitances between source node and the gate and the source node and the body are connected to this X1, right? So CX1 is simply CSB2 this plus CGS of 2 plus C int of this one, right? Now to make our life simple, what we do is we assume that the CSB2 plus the CGS of 2 is equal to C int of 2. That's fair assumption for first hand calculations. However, it overestimates. But for first hand calculation, it's fine. So now if we assume that it's C int of 2, we can express CX1 as gamma CG0 2 plus 2, right? Because 2 is the width of these two MOSFETs. Since your C int is proportional to width, so it's 2 times gamma C0 for this as well as for this. So your CX1 becomes gamma into 4 CG0, right? So now let us represent this by its equivalent resistor switch network, which we have drawn earlier. Let us now quantify these resistances. So what is R equivalent of 1? R equivalent of 1 is equal to R equivalent of 2 equals to half R equivalent of 0. What is R equivalent of 3 equals to R equivalent of 4? That is equals to R equivalent of 0, right? That, that is because of the sizing. Now that we know the different capacitances and the different resistances, we can find out the delay. But here it's not very simple. I mean, the case is not very simple. Why? Right? Because, you know, in the case of discharging, what may happen is if A equals to B equals to 1, then this load capacitor will be discharged through this as well as this CX1 will be discharged through this. So in these cases, what happens is, you know, uh, these, I would say, uh, internal load capacitances that also come into picture because here we are not only discharging the load, we have to first discharge this CX1. I mean, once A is equals to B equals to 1, First, this will be discharged and then this will be discharged or they are discharged parallelly, right? So we have to ensure that these two nodes, I mean, this node is at ground and this node is also at ground, right? So to ensure that what happens, these two, I mean, even this node capacitance, this also comes into picture and this also plays a role. We'll see how, but now the situation is not a very simple RC network. I mean, it, it's not simple RC circuit. It's a distributed RC network. Because we have this R equivalent, R equivalent 1, R equivalent 2, we have CX, CX1, so we have two capacitors here. This looks somewhat like a ladder network, but in order to you know do first hand calculations for such ladder networks, first hand calculation of delay of such ladder networks, we shall first study how exactly we can find the delay of a distributed network. So let's say this is a distributed network. And what are the assumptions? while calculating the delay of this distributed network first step input is applied only at one input node so no other node is acting at, as the input step input is applied to this node which is the single input node to this network second all capacitors all node capacitors are placed between node and like the node at the ground this is one of the reasons why we always you know because we have to do these analysis that is why we always place that cgd in between some node and ground so that you know first hand calculations become easy because all the analysis that have been you know the first hand analysis or the analytical calculations which people have formulated that are only for these kind of scenarios when the capacitances are between node and the ground now it would become very obvious to you why we actually divide that cgd into two components one as cgd one as twice cgd and one as cgd by two right and the other kind of uh, assumption is that there are no resistive loops that is no resistance is connected to any other like there's no loop like this right so these are the three assumptions under which elmore kind of calculated the delay of this distributed network so he kind of formulated this delay expression by assuming or by you know 
describing two different kinds of resistances so one we can like one he classified as the path resistance so how do you define that path resistance so path resistance is nothing but the total resistance going from source node to node i so let's say we have to find out the path resistance between this source node r and this i node so what is the path between that so path consists of r1 r3 and ri so what will be the path resistance so it will be r1 plus r3 plus ri right now he also defined something which he called shared path resistance so what is the shared path resistance so shared path resistance is resistance shared among paths from source node s to nodes k and i so he defined that as r i k and how this is defined as its summation of r j where what is r j r j is all those resistances which come at the intersection of path from s to i and path from s to k let's say uh, we have to find out you know r of let's say i and 4 right let's say we have to find out r of i and 4 k is equals to 4 right so we'll find out first rj which are common between path from s to i and s to k that is r to i and r to k so what are the resistances that are common between r to 4 and r to i it's r1 and r3 right so r1 and r3 are common between r going from like r to 4 and r to i so what what is your rj or what are your rjs so rjs are r1 and r3 and what is your rik that is what is your ri4 ri4 is nothing but r1 plus r3 right that is how you find out the shared path resistance and then we say that you know or then elmore proposed that his delay or uh, the first order time constant of the network is given by summation of k going from 1 to n that is the number of total number of these nodes ck times rik what is this ck ck is nothing but the capacitance as those nodes and what is rik rik is the shared path resistance so that is how elmore classified its first order time constant so this is your time constant right so if we find out the time constant for this load capacitor ci then what is the delay it's simply 0.69 times this time constant right that is how people do it so now let us see what exactly is the case in digital circuits so in digital circuits typically we don't have these branching what we have is i mean for digital circuits we don't have this free kind of structure what we have is we have these ladder kind of structures so you have r1 c1 r2 c2 r3 c3 and so on between v and v out right so for this if you want to find out the effective load uh, effective time constant of this load that is cn that comes out as summation of ri 1 to n summation over of j equals to i to n cj and once you do that it comes out as you know n into n plus 1 by 2 rc if all these resistances are equal all these capacitances are equal right that is the special case i mean when all these resistances are equal to r and all these capacitances are equal to c then this tau n comes out as n into n plus 1 by 2 rc i would encourage you to kind of you know derive this on your own and notice that here this delay or this time constant actually is proportional to n square and this is just a special case of three where you know it's just you know uh, that there are no tree like branching it's just a ladder kind of structure and the same thing also goes for modeling interconnects so large wires also they are modeled like this itself resistance is distributed and not lumped there so that is how you uh, model interconnects as well so now you know that you know the tau n is here that is n into n plus 1 by 2 times rc which is proportional to n square now with this elmore approximation or elmore delay method let us calculate the delay of a NAND gate so let us first take the case of tplh so what is tplh tplh is basically we have to find out the equivalent resistance or i would say the equivalent time constant at this node right because it's output which we are bothered about what is that so best case tplh both of them are conducting right a bar equals to zero b bar equals to zero that is both these switches are turned on so in that case what exactly is the equivalent resistance it's r equivalent three parallel r equivalent of four right and what is the output load capacitance it's cx 
So what's the best case TPLH? It's 0.69, half R equivalent, equivalent zero, and then value of CX, which is gamma, two plus two beta times CG zero, which we calculated earlier. Now, what is the worst case TPLH? Worst case TPLH, either A, either this is conducting or this is conducting. Other one is the switch is not connected. So what is that? That would be simply 0.69 R equivalent three CX or 0.69 R equivalent four CX. And that would be 0.69 R equivalent of zero. And then this CX, which is gamma two plus two beta times CG zero. Now, why exactly this R equivalent zero? Because we have sized them such that their resistances are equal and it is R equivalent of zero. Now the TPHL is something which is interesting. So what is best case TPHL? Uh, TPHL? How we define the best case TPHL? So what exactly happens in TPHL? We have to make this node as ground as well as this node as ground in case of TPHL. Because if this is discharging, it will also charge this. So until this capacitance goes to you know, zero, I mean, this node voltage goes to zero, this won't discharge fully, right? So what is the worst case? Or let's first talk about the best case. So the best case is when B is equals to one already, and A is going from zero to one. Why is it the worst? Why is it the best case? Because if B is equals to one, this node has already discharged to ground via this R equivalent of one. And now we just have to discharge this like output capacitor through a series resistance of this to ground. So what is the best case TPHL then? So the best case TPHL then is equal to 0.69 R equivalent one plus R equivalent two CX. Why? Because this node voltage is already zero. I mean, this, this node has already discharged uh, uh, initially because B is equals to one. So now the CX effective time constant of the CX is only R equivalent of one plus R equivalent of two. So best case TPHL is 0.69 R equivalent of one plus R equivalent of two times CX. This is 0.69 R equivalent of zero, gamma, two plus two beta times CG zero, right? So this is your uh, best case TPHL. Why R equivalent of zero? Because we have sized them two and two, right? Now let us look at worst case TPHL. So in worst case TPHL, what happens? A is equal to one and B toggles from zero to one. So when A is equals to one, what happens? This conducts, I mean, this switch conducts and this CX1 is also charged, right? CX1 is also charged to some value. And what would be that value? If this is VDD, this would be simply VDD minus VTN, right? Because N MOSFET passes VDD minus VTN. So if this is VDD, this will be charged to VDD minus VTN. However, now the discharging of this will also depend upon discharging of CX1. So for finding out the equivalent time constant of this configuration, we have to switch to L mode element. So according to the L mode element, what exactly is the effective time constant here? The effective time constant will be points, like it will be R equivalent of CX1 plus R equivalent of one plus R equivalent of two CX. That is the equivalent time constant of this network. And then what will be the delay? It will be 0.69, that equivalent time constant. So by L mode delimited, what exactly is the equivalent time constant of this? It's R equivalent of one times CX1 plus R equivalent of one plus R equivalent of two times CX. This is the case when you know we have to discharge both these nodes. So if you put the values, you find out that it comes out as 0.69, half R equivalent of zero, gamma times four CG zero plus 0.69 R equivalent of zero, gamma times two plus two beta CG zero. So this is your worst case EPHL. Now, what is the swing of this internal load? Internal load is swinging from VDD minus VTN to zero, right? Because this gets charged to VDD minus VTN if the moment this is turned on, because MOSFET can only sweep or it can only pass VDD minus VTN. Now, there's this definition of critical signal. So how do we define a critical, like how do we say that a signal is critical or the input is critical? So the signal which assumes a stable value at last or which changes at last, that is called the critical signal for any circuit design. And what is the critical path? So critical path is the charge or discharging path which handles this critical signal. And that in turn determines the speed, right? So this is how we define critical signal and critical path. So this critical path is very important 
because the propagation delay of the entire circuit depends upon the delay of the critical path and that is something which uh, you know people try to optimize using those uh, automation tools semi custom in semi custom design as a designer you will be only getting that the frequency of operation is this now that frequency of operation is converted to the delay of the critical path so in your design you have to first find out the critical path and then you have to minimize its delay such that it meets the spec of the maximum operating frequency so the kind of uh, you know the kind of uh, guideline here the design guideline is that you have to first identify the critical signal and what is the critical signal it's the signal which assumes the stable value at last or which tolerates at last and the charge or discharge path which is actually handling this critical signal and which is actually responsible for determining the speed that is the critical path and that you have to you know uh, analyze very carefully because that in turn determines your exact i would say uh, speed of your exact overall circuit so what people generally do is they go for something which is called input reordering so what what this says input which toggles last should be kept far from ground and as close to the out as possible why so here you see these two cases so if a was toggling from 0 to 1 and b was equals to 1 it represents the best case to be achieved right so here the input which is toggling last it's kept close to the out and hence it gave you best case tph whereas in worst case tph what was there a was equals to 1 and b was toggling from 0 to 1 so the input which is toggling last which is the critical signal if it is placed far from the out closer to the ground then you see it results in worst case tph so the general trend is to input like reorder the inputs such that the gates which are close to the out and far from the ground they receive the critical signal so that is a design guideline okay now let us see what happens when you use you know n input nand gates so let us draw its equivalent resistor switch network so it looks something like this right now this i leave to you i mean the calculations i leave to you you analyze it yourself so for i equals to n minus 1 that is these you know uh, these i would say uh, nodes equivalent cxi is what what is cxi cxi is this thing i mean the intermediate node capacitances equivalent cxi is 2 n gamma cg0 why 2 n gamma cg0 what is the node capacitance here it's gamma cg0 plus gamma cg0 and since both are size 2 or since both are sized n here right so here you see that they are sized n each of the n mosfet in the pull down network is sized n so let us calculate the node capacitance here so it is n times gamma cg0 plus n times gamma cg0 so cxi all these nodes will have a capacitance 2n gamma cg0 what is cxn let us calculate that so let us first for that let us first calculate the capacitance seen by one input so for one input let's say a1 no sorry uh, it won't be that right it won't be that in terms of area we could have done that but here we cannot do that because what is your cxn cxn is the effective capacitance seen by this node itself not the other nodes right so what are the different mosfets that are connected to these nodes so all the pull up mosfets p mosfets are connected to this node and this pull down mosfet is connected to this so what would be uh, the equivalent capacitance here so equivalent capacitance would be n times beta times gamma cg0 so n times beta times gamma cg0 that would be the contribution of this pull up network and what would be the contribution of this mosfet it would be n times gamma times cg0 right because it's sized n so it's n plus n beta times gamma cg0 right this is how you find out the intermediate load capacitances and this load capacitance now what is exactly your r equivalent of i so r, r equivalent of 1 to n here going from here to here i mean if you look at r equivalent of 1 if you name this r equivalent of n so sorry it should be r equivalent of n so it is r equivalent 0 by n right because its width is n times and what exactly about the r equivalent of n plus 1 to 2 n here it's simply r equivalent of 0 because we have sized it as beta itself so what is the worst case tphl 
looking at what is the worst case TPHL for it, right? Because that is what is more interesting. So worst case TPHL is just apply your Elmo delay method. So it's going from R equivalent to CX1, it would be R equivalent CX1. Effective time constant would be R equivalent CX1, R equivalent plus R equivalent to CX2, dot dot dot, R equivalent plus R equivalent to plus dot dot dot, R equivalent of N times CXN, right? So if you do that analysis here, you'll find out that it's equal to 0 0.69, R equivalent 0, summation I equals to 0, I equals to 1 to N, ICI. What is the summation of I equals to 1 to N, ICI? That will be proportional to M square R equivalent 0, CX. So we found out here that, you know, TPHL also increases quadratically with N. What else was increasing quadratically? The area. TPHL is also increasing quadratically. Area was also increasing quadratically with N. Wherein is the number of inputs or N fannings. What about TPLH? So TPLH increases linearly. Why? Because this C in, I mean this CXN, CXN increases linearly. So TPLH increases linearly. Here we are assuming that, you know, our uh, load capacitance is not, it's just this intrinsic capacitance, which is, it is driving. Since C int is kind of increasing linearly, it's a function of N. So TPLH increases linearly. However, your TPHL and the worst case kind of increases as N squared. So that is a dangerous indication that is TPHL follows a quadratic relationship. Area and TPHL that follow a quadratic relationship with M. What exactly are the design guidelines in order to reduce TPHL? One way of reducing it is we can reduce the R equivalent zero. Sorry, we can reduce this their R equivalent by increasing the size of all these MOSFETs. So if we increase their size, effectively, this thing will reduce, right? I mean, I mean this, uh, this, instead of this R equivalent zero, it would be R equivalent zero by something else, right? So that would somewhat reduce. That is good, I mean, that is a good technique, but at the same time, it increases the area significantly and it does not help much if the CL is dominated by C int, right? Because if you are increasing the sizes, then this internal load capacitance is also changing and even the CL is increasing, right? So increasing the size of all the MOSFETs, although it reduces the TPHM, but that is not a feasible option or that is not that attractive an option. So what you can do is you can go for progressive scaling. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, size of this M1, which is at the lowest, should be largest and then as you go ahead in this inverter, uh, not in the inverter, sorry. So the size of this M1 should be the largest and as you go towards this V out, you reduce the size. And what is the purpose of doing this? Purpose is that since this R equivalent of 1, it will come in the time constant of all these capacitances, right? So if it is coming in the R equivalent of all these capacitances, I mean in the time constant of all these capacitances, then if it is minimal, then its impact on the delay would be less or the delay in fact would be less because this R equivalent of one will come in all the time constants, right? Similarly, R equivalent of two, it will come in all the time constants apart from this node and in the capacitor at this node. So progressively, if you make this transistor as pretty large and then you reduce the sizes, I mean, all, obviously, uh, this should be, I mean, this transistor should be sized n. Then you can reduce the dominant resistance, which is R equivalent of one, R equivalent of two, and so on, without increases, without increasing the capacitance or area significantly. So this progressive, progressive scaling is also one of the design guidelines that you can get directly. Note that here, we are kind of increasing the area of the, or the size of the transistor, which is closest to the ground for reducing TPLH, sorry, for reducing TPHL. Whereas if you remember from previous lecture, we were increasing the size of this, right? We were increasing the size of this for achieving VTC, symmetric VTC, or I would say not exactly symmetric VTC, but for having non, like for having overlapping VTC. What was the worst case there? The worst case was that, you know, this, its VT was increasing because of body effect and its VGS was not effectively V input. So in that case, we told that we increase the width of this so that effectively, even if it is, even if the VGS is less, even if the VT is large, it gives you the same current or it gives you a higher current. And that way we are trying to uh, kind of, you know, 
make VTC symmetric or avoid that worst case. Or that was a guideline given for worst case with respect to VTC. There we were increasing the size of the transistor which was close to this output node. Here, in contrast, we are changing you know, the size of the transistor which is farthest from this. Right? So, see the difference. I mean, uh, different parameters for optimizing different parameters, the design guideline, guidelines may be different. That is the main message that I wanted to give you. And also, what people do generally is they avoid this kind of, you know, design of these combinational circuits with large fannings. So, what they do is they go for logic restructuring. What that essentially means is they partition the gates which are having large fanning into several stages with smaller fannings. So, if you have this AND gate, 6 input AND gate, its delay will be proportional to 36 something and its area would be also proportional to 36 something. What people do is instead of having these 6 inputs to this AND gate, they will propose it in two stages. First, two NAND gates, three inputs. So, here it is proportional to 9, here it is proportional to 9 and this is proportional to 4. So, 9 plus 9 plus 4. It's 22 only. I mean, 22 whatever uh, the further term is in brackets. Here it was 36 something in brackets. Here it is 24 something in brackets. Sorry, 22 something in brackets. So, that way we have reduced both the area as well as the delay, right? So, this is something which people will do typically in order to reduce, you know, or in order to design gates with multiple fannings. I mean, they don't go for, when the number of inputs is large in your design, you don't go for only one gate with a high fanning. Instead, what you do is, you go for multiple gates with less number of fannings. And that improves your design significantly. 